Good day, everyone. Welcome to our next worked example. We are busy with connection design, and right now we're going to have a look at an eccentrically loaded welded gusset plate. So a gusset plate with a weld each side, and how to design that. This is part of the Structural Design 424 course at Stellenbosch University. So just introducing the problem to you. Consider the drawing of a tension connection as shown below. The connection is subject to a tensile force Tu as shown in the figure. Answer the following. Calculate the maximum size of Tu as based on the capacity of the fillet weld that connects the gusset plate to the column flange. And then calculate the maximum size of the low Tu as based upon the capacity of the bolts that connect the two uh, angle sections to the gusset plate, i.e. consider only the bolt shear and bolt bearing forces. So looking at the diagram, then make sure you have a, a copy of these, these notes. Here we've got a column at 203, 20346 with a base plate below with a um, star-shaped angle. So it's an angle each side connected to this gusset plate pulling on it. And there's our force TU. And then edge of 12 mil thick gusset plate welded to the column. And then there is our column, each angle connected to gusset plate using um, M20 in drilled holes, so that helps us with the hole size. And then we've got 7 mil uh, welds each side, and then this is all applied at an angle of 50 degrees. And then two number 120 by 120 by 8 angle sections in star-shaped configuration. And we're really interested in this weld first, and then after that the bolted connections. Because when the force is applied, this TU force, right there, TU force applied to the connection. It is applied along this line, which is off the middle of this weld. So it's actually going to twist the weld and cause moments in it. So having a look at our problem, calculation of TU based on the fillet weld side. So eccentricity causes moments in the weld. Convert all forces to be at the center of weld. So there's our center of rotation of the weld. We've got some force TU acting at 50 degrees, and we want to convert everything to a force acting there. Now this force is going to have components acting here. So what I'm going to, to mark out, I'm first going to note that there is a Y component to this force. Uh, change pens as it's suddenly dried up. I've got a vertical component here. So this I'm going to call TUY. So that's the force acting upwards. And then I've got a horizontal force due to the this called TUX. And then also we've got a moment because, as I said, this force is applied on this axis, which is twisting this bolt group around. So we're also going to have a moment like this. And I'm going to call that force MU. And all of those need to be considered. And if we start plotting the influence of those different forces, we can start seeing where in the um, weld group it's actually going to govern. So I'm just going to shift this up and then move in. So here you can see I've just drawn three axes of the weld. And when we apply TU, Y, what this does is it's going to create shear forces all the way along. So we are creating vertical shear forces all the way up our axis. So that's our weld axis there. That's the 567 mils. So just to clarify that. So there is our weld, 567 mils, and then when that load is applied upwards, it creates a shear all the way along there. Then secondly, we've got our force TUX horizontally. So then once again, it's going to cause a horizontal force all the way along. So each one millimeter of weld will have some sort of horizontal component as well. And then in addition to that, we've also got our moment, which is now going to cause additional stresses in the weld group. And if we plot that, the influence of the moment about the center of rotation, we're going to get something like this, where the outer weld is most stressed, 
and then inside there is no, mo no stress due to the moment and then maximum stress once again. So looking at that, we can quickly identify which is most stressed, which part, because we've got a vertical component horizontal and taking the vector sums of these, we can actually see that that position is most critical. So we need to just check one position along this whole weld. As long as that stressed position is okay, then we're fine for our design. So this is stresses in weld. And I've just shown you those. And therefore, the maximum stress is at the bottom, as I just mentioned, because of those three forces acting together. So we're going to have a vector sum at some angle. And when this occurs, if I just take those three forces out of here, and uh, just graph them together. I'm going to have, as I mentioned, some vertical component, a horizontal component, and then another horizontal component due to the TUX. That'll give me a final stress, a final force, force per millimeter, like that, that black line. That's what I'm trying to check in my design and make sure that at this resultant at some angle is sufficient. So be careful when you're doing weld design because you'll, there's an angle we'll work with soon. And often we think that that angle is the angle of the load, which it's not. The angle that governs the capacity of a weld is the angle of the resultant on that millimeter. Because here we're checking this little one millimeter of weld with some resultant acting on it. And we're checking the angle relative to the weld axis here and making sure that theta, theta there, which influences the capacity. And as long as this one millimeter is sufficient, we're okay. So now I'm going to start with the equations and uh, putting in. That was just to explain what's actually happening in this group and where the, the stresses are acting. So moving on. We've got the different components. Um, so our forces at weld center are the following. And I'm going to work out everything in terms of TU, simply because we're actually solving for it. Normally we're given the force, but in this case we have to solve for the force. And uh, just to make our life easy, I'm just going to solve for the cos 50. And then our Y component is TU sine 50. And then our moment, we're also going to have the, the moment capacity. And that moment acts at some eccentricity E, where E, our eccentricity, is 567 over 2 minus the distance between the middle of the bolt and the center. So just to explain, we've just calculated this distance E here. So it's half the height of the weld minus this 196 millimeters in the corner. Um, so that E equals 87.5. And we're going to use that in our design. Because once we've got our eccentricity, we can calculate our moment. So our moment is simply TUX times E. And then you can... Plug all that in, and you'll find that's 56.3 TU. So that gives me all the components X, Y, and moment. Now we can start running through the um, forces and calculating the force per millimeter. So now, moving along, force per millimeter in weld. We've got a perpendicular stress or per perpendicular force. This is going to be due to this equation.
equals, and then you just plug in all the values, and then solving this, I'm going to come to this value, all in terms of Tu. So this is a force acting perpendicular to the weld. So that has both a component due to moment and a force due to the x component. So that's what I was showing you. This, that blue line plus the red line, this gives us that perpendicular component. Then we're going to get a shear component. And this is simply due to TUY divided by the length of weld. And at this stage, I'm dealing with both sides of the weld. So be careful. Either you can divide your loads and then design one side and the other. I'm, I'm actually doing both sides together. Either way is, is possible. And then, let's go. As I said, I'm not showing all my workings just so we don't spend our lives writing stuff down. Now that we've got our force perpendicular, our force vertically, we can now solve for our resultant. Just using Pythag. And then if we do that, as it you go right all the details in, and we have this force in terms of T U. Now we also need the angle of resultant. And this was the theta value I was showing you earlier, that we've got theta, and that's ten to the negative one of Fp over Fv, and then fill it all in. Thankfully, our Tu values cancel out. So when we get this, then we end up with the angle of 58.23 degrees. So looking at what I've just shown you previously, we've solved for this. We've now got our Fp. We've got a vertical component. We've got a resultant. And then we have this acting at some angle theta to the axis of the weld, 58.23. So now we have all the information we need to, to check the capacity of our weld. When it comes to that, we must make sure that both the weld resistance and the base metal resistance are sufficient. So check, we'll determine, check weld capacity. Because having a look at this, if I now come back to this, I've just got another example here, and I zoom in on this weld, each side you'll see some weld that looks like that. So there's my base plate. There's my column coming down. Well, sorry, there's my gusset and there's my column. This weld here and we take it to fail along that diagonal. It could fail through the weld material, or it could actually fail the base metal. So it can actually fail the steel. So when we do the calculations where there's two checks, both does the base metal fail, and then does the weld metal fail? And either of those could govern, and it depends on a number of factors. So we're going to now check both, both base metal failure and weld metal failure, see which one is, is more likely to govern. And uh, that, the, depending on the which one governs, depends on the angle, that angle theta. So coming back to our calcs, check weld capacity. Um, our base metal at failure. Now, our ultimate stress in the weld will equal our resistance in the weld. So this is what we've just calculated previously. And this is 0.67 partial factor area and strength of the, the weld. Plugging this in and starting, because remember I'm looking for TU. 
So this was the resultant. Um, Not point six seven times not point six seven, and the material that we're checking. This is just the the length along the weld, and it's a seven mil weld, so it means seven millimeters at the side is connected to the the base material. So, but now I'm going to take two times seven, and that two is simply because I've got two sides. So once again, either you can check. Um, divide the loads by two or double the weld up. Either way works. Um, just be careful that you are consistent. And then times by the strength of the steel, the, the base metal. So once again, just be careful that is based on the, the steel strength. And by solving this, the maximum force can be 1149 kilonewtons. So that's the potential of what the base metal will offer. But now we're going to check the weld material. And remember, when we check the weld material, we check it at its narrowest position, which is actually at 45 degrees. So that was that diagonal line there. And so, weld material at failure. Once again, our ultimate stress equals the resistance of the weld metal. And this is 0.67 times by phi. And there's our, that's our strength of the weld metal. And then multiply that 1 plus 0.5 sine 1.5 theta. So this final term, which is multiplied by the rest, Influence the capacity, and that's where that theta we calculated earlier was quite important. Now, running through this, we first make sure that the angle, the thickness where it fails at 45 degrees, is sine of 45 times the width of the weld. And uh, remember, once again, here we also have two of those, so we're going to multiply everything we do by two. So, plugging in the values we've previously calculated. We put all of those in the equation. Partial factors. And then we've got two welds, so it's two, times by seven moles, times by sine of 45. Otherwise, you'll see sometimes sine of 45 is written as 0 .0, um, 0 0.707, which is also fine to use. We've got our XU value. Just emphasize that. Um, we've got our x u value, and then we also multiply this by the influence of the angle of stress on the weld. And there, if we solve this that we've just done, T u is 1153 kilonewtons, so it's 115 kilonewtons. That means then our minimum is 1149 kilonewtons and base metal governs. So that takes us through the full calculations um, to get right from the load through to a final force that uh, is the maximum capacity. Now this is a very high load. I mean, 1,149, 115 cars hanging from this angle. So you can see that in this, in this case, there's a huge amount of capacity along this weld length. And uh, normally such welds are quite heavily over-designed, which is fine. But uh, what you could even do in this case, you could probably simplify it if you find, for instance, that the force in this was 500 kilonewtons. You may simplify the equation quite a bit if you make sure you move the weld center to be at it and you only design the bottom section. You have a virtual gusset plate. That would make your calcs a lot easier, but we've gone through the, the detailed one where we had a moment, but you can get rid of that moment and then simply use the 50 degrees for the design if, if needs be. Okay, now we're going to go on to the, the next part of the, the problem. We need to check the capacity of bolt resistance. So how much bolt resistance can we have when this is, is failed? 
this was covered quite extensively in the previous example, um, the previous worked example we went through. So I'm not going to explain all the, the calculations we're doing. Uh, you can refer to the, the other video that is available online for the rest of these calcs. But first we're just going to check bearing resistance, check only angle, because the angle we're designing um, is thinner than the gusset, is less than the thickness of the gusset plate. So the gusset plate won't govern in bearing, and... Um, Also now, our edge distances are equal. Equal for both. Because the edge distance does influence the capacity of the section. But the edge distance for the angle, um, sorry, for the gusset plate is 40 mils and for the angle is 40 mils as well. So either of those could potentially govern, but since they're the same, the one with the thinnest plate will be critical. So now we're going to say number of bolts. We've got eight of them, all in she single shear, and our bearing resistance is 3, 5, B, R, T, D, and just be careful, this is, remember, the ultimate of the steel that we're dealing with, not the ultimate capacity of the bolt. And uh, filling all those, we get a force of 1209 kilonewtons. Then edge distance. Otherwise, you called it pull-out failure. And what we have there is our bearing resistance is phi B A T. And then this is both of the angle that we're dealing with. I'm just going to call it A angle and T angle just to make sure you realize it's not the gusset plate we're checking times by N. We insert all of those and we have 806 kilonewtons. So we actually can start seeing that this is probably going to govern the bearing resistance of the due to edge failure pullout. And now also shear failure. And we're going to assume the threads in the plane. And now our shear resistance, because we're using the formula where the shear, it fails at the plane where the threads are. And then just make sure we're using 830 MPa. I'm actually just going to call it FUB. Just to remember, this is the bolt strength not the steel strength now. Bearing is a material failure of the, the steel, and shear resistance is the failure of the actual bolt itself. 701 kilonewtons is our final resistance. So, looking at that, therefore, shear resistance governs. And our maximum force is 701 kilonewtons, which is actually a fair amount lower than we calculated in the, the last example. So here you can see any either of the failure mechanisms could have governed the weld or the, the bolt. And we actually found that in this case, because of the sides of the, the welds, which are quite over-designed, the, the bolts will now govern the capacity. Okay, thank you very much.